Well, hello for you, and how y'all doing today? Um, let's take a look at solving polynomial inequalities. Um, our goal today, I can solve polynomial inequalities without technology. That's without it. No technology today. Well, calculator maybe. Um, using curve sketching or interval tests. So we're going to look back at our interval tests, and so we're going to start by just doing examples and I'll talk about certain methods as we're doing examples. So we want to solve x squared minus x is greater than 12. Now as we saw in the last one when we were using technology it's much easier if we rearrange it first. So firstly as we saw yesterday which maybe wasn't yesterday um, might have been a couple days ago I don't know but this process is much easier if we rearrange to get one side equal to zero. So I subtracted 12 off both sides. And remember that's a perfectly valid thing to do. Uh, unless you multiply or divide both sides by a negative, it's exactly the same as um, using an equality sign there. And even if you do multiply or divide both sides by a negative number, um, you can still do it, just remember to switch this sign around when you do. So here's our parabola. And we want to figure out when this parabola is greater than zero. So method number one, draw a rough sketch of the function by first factoring and finding the zeros. So you got to remember how to factor. Um, this is a pretty easy one on you. x squared minus x minus 12 is greater than zero. If I factor this, it's a simple trinomial. Uh, we got x's at the front. Uh, we got signs, this means the signs are different, so there's one plus and one minus. So we're looking for two things that multiply to 12 and subtract to 1. Um, so that would be 4 and 3. 4 and 3 multiply to 12 with a difference of 1. Uh, and I need more negatives, so I got to put the 4 here and the 3 here. So now we're going to do a rough sketch of this. Here's my rough sketch. Uh, I know it crosses the axis at negative 3, and I know it crosses the axis at positive 4. Those are the zeros. Zeros. Zeros are negative 3 and positive 4. Uh, I know it's right side up, because there's no negative out in front of the x squared, so bloop, there is my parabola. So now I'm only concerned with when this parabola is greater than zero. So let's take my highlighter. Let's take a green highlighter and let's highlight the part of the parabola that is above the x-axis. So it'll be that piece and this piece. And now we just have to turn it in to a math statement as far as where the x's occur. So we're only looking left and right. See, I got nothing up and down. So we're only looking left to right to see where this thing occurs. And it occurs after 4, okay, because before 4 it's in here. Or it occurs before negative 3. So the way we would write that down, we would say x is less than negative uh, 3 or x is greater than 4. Or if you want to write it in interval notation, uh, and notice I didn't put equal to signs here. I didn't put equal to signs here because we don't care when it's equal to zero. It didn't tell us that. There's no equal to sign up here. So I don't put equal to signs down here. Now if I write it in interval notation, this is the interval that goes all the way over here from negative infinity up to negative three. So I would say x is within the interval negative infinity to negative three and it doesn't include negative 3 and it doesn't include infinity, so we're going to use round brackets for both of those. Um, or x is within the interval, x is an element of, oh, and that looks like a 6, not supposed to be a 6. Um, x is an element of uh, the interval from 4 to positive infinity. So I do 4 to positive infinity, and it doesn't include either 4 or positive infinity, so I use round brackets. Okay, now the other thing we could do, rather than doing a rough sketch, is we could actually do an interval table, if you like interval tables. They're a little bit more work than doing a rough sketch, but if you're not very confident in your sketching abilities, maybe you're more confident in your interval table. So here's our intervals, and we still need to know where the zeros are. We still have to factor and find the zeros. So we know that our zeros, once again, our zeros were negative 3 and 4. So here's how we're going to set it up. We've got intervals, and each interval is bounded by a zero because when it switches from positive to negative, it does it at 
zero. Um, so our intervals go from negative infinity to the first numeric zero, which is negative three. And even if I'd wrote this as four and then negative three, negative three is still the first numeric zero because negative three comes first on the number line. So negative infinity to negative three, negative three to positive four, and positive four to positive infinity. And round brackets all the way. So we have to check the sign of our factors. Here are our factors. x plus 3 is one factor, and x minus 4 is the other. And then this is going to be whatever the sign of f at x is, or p at x, or whatever you want to call that darn parabola from the beginning. So if all of my x's are really big negative numbers, when I add 3 to them, there's no way I'm getting positive, so that stays negative. If x is a really big negative number and I subtract 4 from it, like these are big negative numbers. Negative infinity is a really big negative number. If I subtract 4, no way I'm getting positive, so that's negative. However, two negatives make a positive, so my overall value of f at x is positive. Now, from negative 3 to, ne to positive 4, it's easiest to pick a nice number within that interval, and the nicest number within that interval has to be 0, because 0 is a really nice number to do math with, simplifies a whole lot of things. If I stick 0 in for an x here, 0 plus 3 is a positive number. It's positive 3, but we don't actually care that it's 3, we just care that it's positive. So we're going to put positive. And if I put 0 minus 4, that's a negative number. When I multiply positives by negatives, I get negatives, so the overall value of the function is negative. Now these are really big positive numbers, right? From 4 to infinity, we can think of really big positive numbers, or we can think of them as being 5 if you really want to. 5 is within this interval. It can be a small positive number. Um, or we can think of really big positive numbers however you want to do it. It just has to be within the interval from 4 to positive infinity. Um, so if I have a positive number and I add 3, still positive. If I have a positive number and all these positive numbers are bigger than 4, when I subtract 4 I'm not getting into the negatives, so this one is also positive. And positive times positive is a positive. And so this says, um, our original question was, when is the parabola greater than 0? So we're looking for the positive spots. So these are the two intervals that we care about, and so we just right beside it we can say x is within the interval of negative infinity to negative 3, or x is within the interval of 4 to positive infinity, which was exactly the same thing we got from doing the sketch. Took a little bit longer, but same idea. Moving right along, something just a tad more interesting. Solve x cubed plus x is less than or equal to x squared minus 6. Let's have a look. What does the star thing here say? Let's pull this out. It says, first we need to get one side to be zero. And we did it there, so I'm going to push that back in for a second. Uh, we're going to rearrange this to get one side to be zero. I want them in descending powers of x because that's just common sense. And so we're going to get x cubed, um, subtract 4x squared, uh, plus an x. And then I'm going to add 6, so I get plus 6. And that has to be less than or equal to 0. And so let's take a look. Bloop, bloop. No matter which method we ultimately use, we'll have to factor the expression. So here we go. Uh, let's go with factor theorem, um, which, remember, we have to figure out uh, what is going to make this 0 with 1. We have to find 1 0 by trial and error, basically, although it's smart trial and error because we know that it has to be a factor of 6. They all have to be factors of 6. Um, so let's see, what makes uh, this thing 0? And if we plug in a bunch of numbers, we find that f at 2 will actually make this 0. So we found one of the zeros, uh, so therefore um, x minus 2 is a factor. And now let's use synthetic division. So I put my 2 out here, and I have 1, negative 4, 1, and 6. 0 here, 1, 2, negative 2, negative 4. Um, negative 3, I thought I made a mistake there, but no, I'm good. Negative 6 and 0. So our f at x 
now becomes uh, x minus 2 was our first factor and now we have the quadratic factor x squared minus 2x minus 3. And x squared minus 2x minus 3 is a simple trinomial so it should be simple to factor. I know I have x's at the front. I know the signs are different so there's one plus and there's one minus. They have to multiply to 3 and subtract to 2. The only thing that multiplies to 3 is 3 and 1 and I need more negatives so I put the 3 here and the 1 here and 3 and 1 do in fact subtract to 2 so I've got this thing factored. So I need my zeros. Zeros. The first zero we had up here was 2. We found one of the zeros by trial and error. You can find them all by trial and error if you really wanted to. Uh, you don't have to factor this, but uh, I hope you know how to factor. We also have negative 1 and positive 3. So I'm going to put those on this graph and then I'm going to use my knowledge from the previous unit to do a rough sketch. So my zeros are 2, so right here, a 2. Uh, negative 1 and 3. So if I graph this thing, I know <clears throat> that it's going to pass through all of these looking roughly linear because all the zeros are of degree 1, sorry, order 1. Uh, I know it is right side up and it's cubic, so that means it has to start down here and end up here. So it has to go voop, voop, voop. Ooh, I missed that completely. Let's try that again voop, voop, voop. Not a whole lot better, but it'll work. Okay, now we are only concerned, our original question was when is f at x, we called this thing f at x, when is that less than zero? So we're only concerned with when it's less than or equal to zero, so this time we actually need to include the endpoints. I'm going to take my trusty highlighter again, this time I'm going to use pink. Um, and I'm going to highlight all of the pieces of this that are less than zero. So there and there. Those are the intervals. Oh, wow, that just straightened on me. Anyway, that part is less than zero. So those are the intervals I'm concerned with. Uh, and remember, we only look left to right because I got a no, no numbers up and down. And so everything that is to the right of negative 1 and everything that is in between 2 and 3. So how do we write that down? Well, we say every that our x is less than or equal to negative 1. I include the equal to this time uh, because it's there. And here it's got to be between 2 and 3. So I say x is between 2 and 3. And now I need some less than equal to signs in there. Always point the way to the smallest number. 2 is smaller than 3 so these have to point that direction and we need equal to signs. Now if I wanted to write it in interval notation this goes from negative infinity way 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 way, way over here Actually, it's way, way, way over there, but we'll call it right there. Negative infinity to 1, so x is within the interval. Negative infinity to negative 1. And this time, with my interval notation, I can put a square bracket there because it actually includes negative 1. And then over here, I would say x is within the interval of 2 to 3. And again, we include both 2 and 3, so we need square brackets. Now, what if I had done an interval test on this thing? That's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to do the interval test. We still needed to do the zeros. So we still had to factor it and find the zeros. So my zeros are 2, negative 1, and 3, but I'm going to rewrite those in numeric order so that I get my intervals right. Negative 1 comes first, 2 comes second, 3 comes third, and so here's my intervals. My intervals are going to go from negative infinity to negative 1. Negative 1 to positive 2, positive 2 to positive 3, and positive 3 to positive infinity. Okay, and those are all my intervals. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, now the factors I'm checking to see what signs are x minus 2, x plus 1, and x minus 3, and when I put them all together I get my trusty f at x and that's what sign I'm worried about because I am only care about when f at x is negative. So let's go through these. From negative infinity to negative 1, these are really big negative numbers. When I subtract 2 from them they are going to stay negative. When I add 1 to them I am not going to get into the positive so they are going to stay negative. When I subtract 3 to them they are going to stay negative. When I have 3 negatives it is going to stay negative so f at x is negative.
From negative infinity to positive 2, 0 is within that interval, so if I plug 0 in for these x's, I get a negative positive negative. And that means that my overall value of the function is positive. From 2 to 3, 2 to 3 are, well, there's 2 and a half in that interval, so we can sort of think of 2 and a half being plugged into x. If I plug 2 and a half in here, um, I don't get into the negative, so that's positive. If I plug 2 and a half in here, plus 1 gives me a positive answer, and 2 and a half minus 3 does take me past the 0, so that's negative. So this is negative. And then these are really big positive numbers, so when I subtract 2, I'm not going to get negative, so that stays positive. When I add 1, it stays positive, and when I subtract 3, these are all bigger than 3, so it stays positive, and so the overall value of the function is positive. And so I am only concerned with the places where it is negative, because originally the question was, where is this thing less than that, and when I rearranged it, I want it less than 0. So I'm only concerned with negative values, because negative values are less than 0, so this is the interval I'm concerned with, and this is the interval I'm concerned with. And we just change those into, we can change it into interval notation. We can say x is an element of negative infinity to negative 1, and we put square bracket, round bracket. You never put a square bracket at infinity because um, we can never get to infinity. Uh, and x is an element of 2 to 3, and since we want to include the zeros, we put square brackets at both 2 and 3. So, there we go. That is solving in equations. Let's see, we got any more? Um, we got a funny one here. Example 3, an object moves along a horizontal in a straight line according to this function, where d is the distance in meters and t is the time in seconds. When will the object be more than 50 meters away? So this is distance, and I want to know when it's more than 50 meters. So I want to know when negative t squared plus 16t is greater than 50. So I'm going to rearrange this thing. I kind of like my t's to be positive, my t squared to be positive. So I'm going to get this side equal to 0 by adding t squared to both sides, subtracting 16t from both sides, and then this 50 is staying on that side, so plus 50. So I have this parabola. This thing doesn't factor. There is not two things that multiply to 50 and add to 16. It's not going to happen. So if it doesn't factor, the only way to find my zeros is with the quadratic formula. And when I find the quadratic formula, then I will go bloop, bloop, and I will actually have, um, I'll get my zeros with the quadratic formula. And once I have my zeros with the quadratic formula, then I'm only concerned with when this is less than zero. Okay, this thing points to the smaller one, so I want this to be less than zero. So when that's less than zero, it means that I need the thing that's underneath the x-axis. So I'm only going to be concerned with what's between the two zeros, not what's on the outside of it. So I have to solve my quadratic formula. So I say something, uh, something really nifty like using the quadratic formula. The quadratic formula. So using the quadratic formula, which is x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all divided by 2a. And let's plug into that and solve. Now I've got it down to this number, um, I'm going to leave it in exact form. So I'm going to use your simplification of radicals that you did in grade 11. Um, 56 can be divided by uh, 4. Um, so 56 is essentially uh, 4 times 14. And I can take the square root of 4. So I'm going to take the square root of 4 and pull it outside of the root bracket. So I have 16 plus or minus 2 root 14 divided by 2. Now 2 goes into both of those, so I can actually divide both of these by 2. So I get 8 plus or minus root 14. So we can actually say, and I know it has to exist between those two things, this here is going to be 8 minus the square root of 14, and this here is going to be 8 plus the square root of 14. Um, and it's worth noting that both of these are going to be positive answers, uh, so this should have been over here. 
Um, and you can get those approximate answers by doing 8 uh, minus the square root of 14, so 4.25, so this is about 4.25, and 8 plus the square root of 14, 8 plus the square root of 14 is 11.7. So D has to lie in between. I just lost my pen. I just had to reboot my tablet there. Um, anyway, um, I got my pen back. Uh, so X is within the interval of, and does it, there's no equal to here. It says greater than. 50, which is nice because we can't be exactly equal to a rational number, uh, your rational number. So x is between, whoops, that should be round, must be round, x is between 4.25 and 11.7, or we can say x is between, and I'm going to use the, uh, the radicals here, x is between 8 minus root 14, and 8 plus root 14. And that is solving rational inequalities. You got some work to do.